Today's discussion will focus on science and technology for development. My name is Chris Addison. I'm a project lead in the technology and innovation department at CRDF Global. Just a few logistical items before we begin. If you have questions for speakers at any time, please enter your questions in the Q&A uh, feature located at the bottom or top of your screen by selecting the Q&A icon. At the, after the panelists discuss, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. If you have any technical questions or issues, message me directly by using the chat feature and selecting my name from the list of panelists. Lastly, this event will be recorded and placed on CRDF Global's website in the coming days. I would like to now turn it over to Gerson Schur, who will introduce himself and provide opening remarks. Good morning. If uh, that is your tuned in from the Western Hemisphere, uh, otherwise good afternoon and even good evening. We have uh, nearly 80 participants from uh, at least 25 countries and five continents. Very exciting. My name is Gerson Scher. On behalf of the organizing committee, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the second in a series of symposia on international scientific cooperation dedicated to the memory of Dr. Victor Rabinowicz. Let me give a brief overview of today's agenda. First, we'll see a beautiful video tribute to Vic assembled by his family. Next will be our panel on international scientific and technological cooperation for global development, co-chaired by John Hurley, formerly of the MacArthur Foundation and the National Academies, and a close colleague and friend of Vic's. We're all close colleagues and friend of Vic's, I'm sure. And Kathy Campbell, retired president and CEO of CRDF Global. The discussion paper today will be presented by Bill Koglazier of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and advisor to Secretary of State Colin Powell, followed by a very distinguished panel. At the end, I'll make a couple of announcements about the next seminar, and I am very pleased to say an award competition for young leaders in international scientific cooperation. Now for the video. Victor's mother and dad, Eugene Victor's mother and dad, Eugene and Anna Rabinowitz, were Russian emigres, actually our mom and dad, since we are twins. Vic was as caring and supportive a brother as one could possibly want. All of us, his devoted family, miss him and find inspiration in his memory every day. Fortunately, our mom and dad escaped Nazi Germany and settled in London in 1934. Here we are, Vic and I, in Golders Green at age three, Vic is on the right. My dad received a position at MIT on the eve of the war, another stroke of good fortune, and we moved to the United States in 1938. We finished grade school near Boston and high school at Uni High, a wonderful University of Illinois laboratory school. An extraordinarily large number of our classmates there went on to truly distinguished careers, but none more than Vic. Here he is in 1993, receiving a lifelong achievement award from our alma mater. Our dad, the well-known physical chemist Eugene Rabinowitz was the in initial inspiration for Vic's lifelong commitment to global scientific collaboration in the interests of world peace. Dad was a founding editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and a founder and lifelong participant in the Pugwash International Conferences. Vic was on the Bulletin board and a participant in Pugwash for many, many years. 
Here is Vic at an early Pugwash conference in 1963 in Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia. Just a wonderful conference venue. Vic's responsibilities took him all over the globe. Only very rarely did our travels cross. Here is Vic with me and my wife Janet on Red Square in Moscow, where we were conducting research in January 1964. Here's another great Pugwash conference venue, Vic in Venice in 1965. And here's Vic with the distinguished and courageous Soviet scientist Andrei Sakharov at a scientific conference in Vilnius, Lithuania. Here is Vic with Walter Rosenblith and Kenneth Pruitt in 1990 at an international development workshop in Atlanta. Throughout these years, Vic remained involved with Pugwash, as this 1994 photo of him at a Pugwash conference in Crete shows. For more than 25 years, Vic held top level positions in programs on science, technology, and international development at the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council. In 1990, he became vice president for programs at the John D. and Carth Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, which became his home base for the remainder of his professional career. One of his prized achievements at the MacArthur Foundation was the creation of the MacArthur Moscow office. Here, he, here is Vic in 1996 with the very capable and wonderfully dedicated staff assembled at the Moscow office. And here is a shot of Vic at the Sakharov Museum in Nizhny Novgorod with Lauren Graham, today's presenter, and Marjorie Seneschal, a member of the organizing committee for the symposium. Vic remained fervently committed to developing programs for young Russian scholars during the remainder of his years at MacArthur and beyond. Here's Vic with the staff at the Moscow office in 2003. And here he is again in 2004 with the co-director of the Mos MacArthur office in Moscow, Tanya Zdanova. In 1943, our dad acquired a farm in the Green Mountains of Southern Vermont. Every summer in the intervening decades, our large family, though scattered around the country, has managed to gather there for at least a few wonderful weeks or months. Here's Vic with his wife, Marty, in front of the barn. As everybody who knew Vic was aware, he was endlessly devoted to family. Vic had three sons, all of them named after Russian czars. Here they are with Vic in 2009, Nikolai, Kolya, uh, Peter, Pete, and Alexander, Sasha. Their mother, Vic's first wife, Ann Collins Rabinowitz, passed away in 1986. Here I am with Vic at the family farm in 2016. Here we are, two years later, in front of a sketch of our dad, drawn by Martel, the dear family friend and Chicago artist who conceived the Bulletin's doomsday clock. Along with caring for family, meeting and making new friends and building international bridges, High on Vic's list of life's pleasures were, uh, was partaking of fine vodka, food, and wine. Here he is with caviar appetizers, which he prepared.
And finally, here is a portrait of Vic not long before his death week. Vic, we all love and miss you every day. Thank you. And um, uh, I should have said at the beginning, the uh, video was narrated by Vic's twin brother, Alex. Alex Rabinowicz, Professor Emeritus of History uh, and World Authority on the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, thank you very much, Alex and Janet and Marty for pulling together those photos. I'm now very pleased to turn the mic over to John Hurley to begin our panel on international scientific and co uh, technological cooperation for global development. Thanks very much, Gerson. And good morning or good afternoon or good evening as it may apply to everybody who joined. I had the privilege of knowing Vic Rabinowicz for the last 49 years of his life, both as a friend and by working directly with him for 30 of those years. Vic was a wonderful person who was empathetic, wise, humorous, and who enjoyed the good things of life, as Alex mentioned, particularly his family, friends, fine dining, and interesting conversation. He combined his scientific background and experience with a genuine concern for how human understanding of the natural world could make a real difference in people's lives. Victor's broad range of interests is illustrated through the three sessions of this memorial symposium. In September, the focus was scientific interaction with Russia. Today, we're examining science and technology for international development. And the third session in 2021, will explore issues of international security and arms control. The professional bond that Victor and I shared was a mutual interest in how science could assist developing countries. This interest was put into practice at the National Academy of Sciences Complex, the NAS, and later at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. At the NAS, Victor was instrumental in creating in 1969, the Board on Science and Technology for International Development, known as BOSTID. He served as Bosted Director until 1982, when he became head of the NAS Office of International Affairs with oversight of a range of international programs, including Bosted. Based in the National Academies complex, Bosted had access to notable expertise in US science, engineering, and medicine. A principle of Bosted's activities with developing countries was that both sides stood to benefit in those interactions. US participants had much to learn from the situations and knowledge in developing countries and vice versa. Boston activities were funded to a great extent by the US Agency for International Development, AID, both from central funding and from specific country funding in places such as Thailand, Indonesia, and Egypt. Beginning in 1981, AID gave priority to science and technology as a focus of its assistance to developing countries. Led by Victor, Boston developed a concept for a large program of scientific interaction with developing countries. After considerable negotiation, Boston received a five-year $36 million grant from the AID Science and Technology Bureau. The duration of the grant ultimately was extended several times. In addition to this large AID grant, Boston also received support from other US and international agencies, from foundations, and sometimes from the developing countries themselves. The large grant was an important part of the aid science for development focus because it added the intellect, intellectual resources of the National Academy complex to AID's own resources and efforts. Some aspects of the grant were unusual for the NAS, such as the research grants, but Victor was instrumental in persuading its leadership of the value of the proposed work. The three principal activities of Boston included, first, 
a program of studies or on little known or underutilized plants, animals, and technologies with promise for use in developing countries. The resulting published reports and books were widely distributed internationally. Boston staff member, Noel Wiedmeyer, a natural products uh, chemist, was the inspiration and enthusiastic champion of these studies, which highlighted topics ranging from the water buffalo to underutilized tropical fruits and dozens of other topics. The second area was activities designed to help developing countries strengthen their scientific infrastructure and policy making capabilities. These activities typically involved workshops and conferences in which US scientists, engineers, or medical personnel exchanged ideas and experience with their counterparts in developing countries. Meetings focused on a specific issue identified by the host country. In other instances, Boston provided long-term advisors who were embedded in a country's national research council or equivalent organization for periods up to several years. And the third area was a research grants program for scientists in developing countries. Boston, with substantial input from developing country scientists, identified problems with major impact in the developing world that required research done in local settings to find solutions. The grants were intended to help strengthen research in developing countries and to foster collaboration between scientists in those countries and US scientists. More than 100 grants were made through this program, resulting in more than 400 scientific papers. The program and its staff were organized and led by Michael Green, a physicist at the University of Maryland, who previously led a research grants program of the Organization of American States. The Boston program had strong support within the National Academy, especially from Foreign Secretary Harrison Brown and noted scientists and Academy members such as Roger Revelle and Carl Gerasi. Boston activities were supported by an experienced and dedicated staff, some of whom have already been mentioned. Other staff stalwarts for most of Boston's existence were Michael Dow, who succeeded me as Boston director in 1991, Rose Bannigan, Jay Davenport, David Mogg, and others. But Boston's success relied on the voluntary efforts of hundreds of US scientists and medical personnel and engineers who participated in its workshops, studies, and research grant activities, along with their counterparts in more than 50 countries. In 1990, Victor was invited to become vice president for programs at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation based in Chicago. It was an intriguing offer, overseeing the programs of one of the country's 10 largest private foundations and one with strong international interests, as well as US grant making. Having spent more than 20 years at the NAS, Victor decided to accept this new challenge. He rose to become senior vice president at the foundation, working with two presidents, Adele Simmons and Jonathan Fanton, and retiring in, in uh, 2000. Besides its substantial US grant making, MacArthur had international programs in human rights, environment, peace and security, and population and reproductive health. International program staff worked from the Chicago headquarters as well as offices in Russia, Nigeria, Mexico, and India, staffed by nationals of the respective countries. Uh, the very capable program heads included uh, good people such as Carmen Barroso, Kenneth Benedict, Dan Martin, and Mary Page. By the early 2000s, international grant making at MacArthur had grown to over $100 million annually. Victor's long experience with international peace and arms control efforts, science cooperation for international development, and human rights enabled him to provide strong leadership to MacArthur's international programs. 
There, as at the National Academy, he initiated imaginative new programs, mentored and guided outstanding staffs, and acted always with integrity and decency. Victor had a remarkable career with important accomplishments in the international issues that we have been discussing in these symposia. His leadership in science and technology for international development, stressing person to person and country to country interactions was especially significant. Issues facing humanity today are ever more complex and consequential and the forces of separation and isolation ever stronger. I know that Vic would challenge us to look forward and find new ways to work together for the benefit of all. Thank you very much. And now it's uh, my pleasure to turn to Kathy Campbell, who as uh, uh, Gerson said at the beginning of the seminar, has retired in 2016 as president and CEO uh, of CRDF Global, which she led for 10 years. She also previously managed international cooperation at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, she has uh, advanced degrees from George Washington University and Georgetown University in Russian and Eastern European studies. She is uh, a triple AS fellow. Uh, she has been in a great many boards and other activities of importance in science and international affairs. And she will now talk about Victor's association uh, with uh, CRDF Global. Okay, thanks so much, John. I'd like to first join Gerson and John in welcoming all of you to this symposium. I did not know Vic when he worked at the Academy or at MacArthur, and so I really enjoyed hearing about that period um, from John. I actually first met Vic when I interviewed for a VP position at CRDF Global in 2002, and Vic served on the selection committee. Once on board at CRDF Global, I quickly became acquainted with Vic's expertise. He is well remembered, of course, for his crucial contributions to the basic research and higher education program an innovative program that CRDF Global launched in partnership with Russia to strengthen research capabilities at Russian universities. The BRHE program was featured during the first Vic Rabinowitz Memorial Symposium event held last month, so I will not dwell on it here. But suffice it to say that Vic's contribution to the program was enormous. He was instrumental in getting it started and he remained actively involved throughout its implementation, providing strategic oversight as the program expanded and evolved. The program benefited a lot from Vic's creativity, deep knowledge of Russia, extensive program experience, strong listening skills, and ability to bridge differing perspectives of the stakeholders in both the US and Russia. But Vic's interest in CRDF global programs extended beyond this one program. He was interested in all of our programs as well as the staff implementing them. Thanks to Vic's initiative, the board of directors created a program committee to bring greater attention to the full range of CRDF global programs in research, capacity building, technology, as well as innovation, technology, entrepreneurship. And of course, Vic served on that committee. Vic's understanding of CRDF global program capabilities combined with his own professional experience helped a great deal when CRDF global made the difficult decision to work in countries beyond Russia and Eurasia, our original geographic focus. Vic understood the benefit of international science collaboration for generating new knowledge, addressing development needs, and advancing global security. And he understood that CRDF global program capabilities could be applied productively in other regions. 
Vic cared deeply about staff, but he also cared about the board of directors and ensuring that the board operated effectively and according to best practices. Along with another board member, Marjorie Seneschal, he led an internal board assessment that resulted in several changes to board operations. One such change of which Vic was a strong supporter was the adoption of a board rotation schedule. Even though that meant that Vic had to be among the first to rotate off the board. This was vintage Vic putting a principle above personal interests. Last but not least, I would be remiss in not mentioning Vic's tremendous warmth and genuine concern for people, particularly staff. He was a friend to many of us. I remember our fondly our conversations about family and really appreciated his empathy and advice. Often those conversations occurred when we were traveling and many times after a few of us gathered for a nightcap or to watch a baseball or football game, which Vic enjoyed. He was a wonderful person and I'm so glad that we are honoring him with this symposium series on issues about which he cared so deeply. So now let's turn to today's symposium and our wonderful lineup of speakers. To all of you, thank you very much for participating. We'll begin with a presentation from Dr. Bill Kohlglazer on the paper that he prepared for this symposium, Science and Technology for Development. Where have we been? Where are we now? And where we need to go? And by the way, that paper is available on the CRDF Global website page for this symposium. Bill will have about 15 minutes <clears throat> to provide an overview. And then I will invite each of four panelists to provide comments or observations, about 10 minutes each. Uh, Mike Green will then finish up with a few minutes of observation and comment. And then we'll turn to Q&A. And for those of you who were not on the call at the outset, a reminder that we'll use the Q&A feature of Zoom to pose questions and I will moderate that session and ask the questions that the audience poses. So with that, let me turn it over to Bill. Bill, uh, as you know, is uh, editor in chief of science and uh, diplomacy and he's a senior scholar in the Center for Science Diplomacy at AAAS. He's, he had a distinguished career at the National Academy of Sciences before he was tapped to become the s and advisor to the US Secretary of State. More recently, he led a group appointed by the UN Secretary General to advise on science, technology, and innovation for achieving the sustainable development goals. Bill, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Kathy. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. And I am a, another member of the Vic Rabinowitz uh, fan club. Uh, my background paper was only posted two days ago because I'm always late, it's overly long. Uh, but I'm just gonna try to hit some of the main themes in, in my talk. Uh, but if you have any comments or suggestions, I, I would greatly appreciate them. It also, the paper represents my personal perspective on science and technology for international development. Uh, so it is quite limited compared, uh, and it also is an American perspective, heavily influenced by my own experiences in academia, the National Academies, uh, and the State Department, and it also advising at the UN. And my, my interest in the developing world actually began when I, between my junior and senior year at uh, Caltech, where I got a fellowship to spend the summer in Latin America uh, investigating of all things, uh, public transportation systems. Uh, but for me, it was a, it was a wonderful eye-opening experience. I learned a lot about the lives of people uh, in these countries. Uh, later, when I was a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow in the mid seventies, I worked for a remarkable Congressman, George Brown, who, who loved science but he also thought science and technology were important for strengthening relations between countries. He was especially interested between the US and Mexico, and later, of course, between the US and, and, and scientists in Russia. Well, I left an academic career in 1978 
uh, to go work for Paul Doty, whose picture you saw on one of this uh, wonderful slideshow about Vic, uh, both at uh, the Harvard Center that, uh, that Paul created, as well as a program he led at the Aspen Institute. And in 1978, we organized a conference in Aspen uh, that was to further the planning for a new development agency, one that had been proposed earlier in 1978 by President Carter. Uh, the name that would have it had would have been the Institute for Scientific and Technological Cooperation, ISTC. Uh, it would focus on the contribution of science and technology to help improve the lives and livelihoods of people in developing countries. Uh, so the U.S. would have had two development agencies, uh, USAID and the ISTC. Uh, the ISTC was really modeled in large part on uh, in Canada, the IDRC. Canada also had two development agencies with the IDRC focused on, uh, uh, again, on the role of science in, in technology. The, uh, the ISTC was authorized by Congress, but funds were never appropriated. And in part, there was opposition. Interesting enough, some came from USAID. Some came from uh, congressmen who were worried about actually stimulating industrialization and creating competitors in the, in the developing world. Uh, but what Congress did do was to provide uh, funds to USAID to create programs, some of which were like those that were envisioned for the ISTC. And you heard from John in his uh, uh, wonderful uh, overview of, of Dick's career uh, with, with Boston that uh, Vic was able to use his skills and networking in order to garner a significant fraction of those funds in the 1980 from USAID. Uh, for the work of, uh, uh, of Boston. Uh, I uh, benefited greatly from Vic's legacy to the National Academy of Sciences and National Research Council when he left to go to the MacArthur Foundation. I <clears throat> became executive director of the Office of International Affairs uh, from 1991 to 1993. I'd come there on a, a sabbatical from, uh, uh, from my university. And OIA was a wonderful place that uh, I learned so much from my colleagues there. It had uh, boards and committees and studies dealing with arms control, human rights, international organizations, committee on scholarly communication with China, committee on Japan. But the largest unit was Boston. Uh, and Boston, as you heard, did also quite extraordinary uh, work. And I won't repeat all of the fine things that John did in reciting about Boston's uh, work. So in the 1990s, Boston continued doing uh, its wide variety of activities, again, largely funded by USAID. I do want to mention one project where I learned a lot, uh, and that was uh, the uh, uh, Boston had a large uh, 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 program that was funded by uh, World Bank Loan to the Government of Indonesia, where Boston had uh, several staff in Jakarta. Uh, Mike Green, who you'll hear from uh, later, was the was the director of, of that office. And it was a, uh, a project that was to help the Indonesians strengthen the, the ability of their universities, their research institutions, their national labs to be more effective in working with and contributing to, to the private sector. A number of very bright young Indonesians were, uh, uh, were trained, uh, but I think the Americans, especially me, learned a whole lot more about the, uh, the challenges and the importance of strengthening uh, science and technology institutions uh, in developing countries. OIA and its work in the, in the 90s uh, had a number of joint projects with uh, scientific organizations in other countries, including in, uh, in China, including in the, in the Middle East. Uh, and one of the, uh, the important aspects of these, not only to focus on important issues related to science and technology for development, and global issues, but also to help strengthen our foreign scientific partners to become more important and more influential advisors uh, to their governments on issues uh, where inputs from science and technology are needed. Uh, they were much more likely to influence their governments than, uh, than advice from, uh, from foreigners. I also want to mention a, a meeting that uh, uh, the new president of the academy at that time, Bruce Alberts, and I were heavily involved in, and that was a meeting in 1993 that was held in India, which was a science summit on world population. Uh, actually, the, uh, the, the rationale for having a meeting of science academies was because then the international 
Council on Scientific Unions, ICSU, was reluctant to, to hold the meeting. Uh, and it was also a very informative uh, uh, meeting, it brought together, I think, 70 or more academies, and they signed a, a joint statement afterwards. But one of the, the important things resulted from it was the creation of a new network of science academies around the world to work together uh, with a particular goal of trying to strengthen the capacity of science academies and countries to be, again, more important advisors uh, to their governments. Uh, later was the creation of the Inter Academy Council, which was uh, modeled after the U.S. National Research Council. Uh, it was uh, there was a board of 15 presidents of science academies from around the world, and they would actually oversee the conduct of expert studies that were done for the UN and for international organizations. One of the, the most important was looking at the processes and procedures of the Intergovernmental on Panel, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC which had had some problems with one of its uh, efforts. And I think the, uh, uh, the study that the academies did, the IEC did actually strengthen uh, the IPCC. Uh, and so I think it was quite important. Well, there were a number of other studies that were done uh, by these inter-academy scientific organizations and now it's called the inter-academy uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, I also wanna mention a, a study that would turn out to be quite influential uh, was done by the academies in the 1990s. It turned out to be quite influential when it, the United Nations through on the, the program in 2015 for the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN 2030 Agenda. One of the mandates from the UN was to strengthen the science policy interface. They realized that they're gonna accomplish the aspirational goals represented by the SDGs, the 17 SDGs. They're gonna to have to do a better job of harnessing input from science and technology. And uh, the professionals at the UN had read this report, this 1999 report called Our Common Journey. Uh, and our common journey, uh, the, the word journey uh, was the fact that I think the important insight was that in order to accomplish these broad goals like those represented by the SDGs, it was really gonna have to be a journey, interaction between the science and technology communities and all of society and governments. Uh, learning by doing, making corrections as you go along, and that was the only way the world was going to reach uh, its aspirations for uh, sustainable development. In the, in the years 2000s, there are many more academy studies addressing uh, all kinds of international issues, including development issues. But there are also, of course, major contributions made by the US government's program, PEPFAR, on HIV uh, in Africa. Also, the uh, AAAS Science and Technology Fellows Program expanded to include fellows who served in the State Department and USAID. Uh, the Jefferson's Fellows Program was created for tenured faculty to do the same thing, created by one of the, my predecessors, a science advisor to a Secretary of State. And the Global Development Lab a, a few years later, which you're gonna hear more about uh, shortly. Uh, with the Global Development Lab, I think it, uh, in many ways, it represents some of the, uh, the types of programs that uh, we hoped would be created by the, the ISTC. Anyway, after 17 years as executive officer of the academies, I went for three years as science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State. It was actually for Clinton and Kerry, not for Colin Powell. Uh, the wonderful Norm Newrider was Colin Powell's science and technology uh, advisor. And when I was there, it was really a golden time for uh, engaging with countries at all levels of development. Science diplomacy was a great asset for, uh, uh, for American diplomacy and so many interactions with uh, scientific organizations and government officials around the world. They were always all wanted to strengthen their capabilities in science and technology to be prosperous, secure, uh, and competitive in this globalized world. There was also the creation of a wonderful science envoy program uh, where Bruce Alberts went to, uh, uh, to Indonesia. Uh, you've heard from Kathy about CRDF Global, another very important organization in all of this. I don't have time to talk about some of the other major networks that are indicated in my paper, uh, the International Institute for uh, Systems Analysis in Vienna, the International Science Council, which is what I, ICSU evolved into, the International Network for Government Science Advice, and you'll hear later about the, uh, the Global Solutions Summit. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention is an initiative that I think is, uh, uh, is, is quite important. The uh, call, uh, 
roadmaps that are science and technology innovation for achieving the sustainable development goals. It's actually a program of the United Nations, uh, several advanced countries, including Japan, several international organizations, UN agencies, uh, the World Bank, and it's to help countries who want to develop what they call their STI for SDGs roadmaps. There are five pilot countries being helped right now, uh, three in, in Africa, uh, includes India, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Ghana, and, uh, and Serbia, but there are a number of other developing countries that are paying attention. And these STI for SDG roadmaps are sort of the intersection of uh, three plans of a country, a sort of national development plan, its plan for increasing its capacity in science, technology, innovation, and its plan for achieving the, the SDGs. And on the UN website, there's a very nice guidebook for countries that are contemplating conducting their roadmap. So it's one way to, uh, we think, to, uh, to really stimulate real action as opposed to just uh, rhetoric in terms of the wide variety of development issues. Uh, and these roadmaps are not only supposed to be to get the attention from prime ministers to all ministers of government, including science and technology ministers, but also to be built up through engagement with, uh, with all sectors of society, including the private sector. And, uh, and, and civil society. Well, what about some of the themes and issues that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, particularly the kind of things that Bostad was doing, the kind of things that ISTC was envisioning, uh, strengthening indigenous science and technology capabilities, people and institutions, and science advising uh, throughout the world, expanding international scientific collaboration and engagement for mutual benefit, uh, focusing science, technology, innovation on actions that can actually improve lives and livelihoods of people throughout the world. I think all of these, uh, these broad themes have been advanced over the last uh, three decades. They were all components of what, what Boston was doing uh, back in the, in the 1980s and 1990s. Well, now we're all facing the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, what has been a real searing learning experience, uh, learning experience for the world, including for the United States. Uh, so what about uh, science and technology for international development after COVID-19? Well, first of all, the pandemic is potentially uh, uh, going to create devastating outcomes for the poorest people on the planet. Uh, multilateral collaboration and financial assistance is absolutely needed from developed countries, including the, the United States. But what is the role of uh, the worldwide scientific community? In my view, it's to work in partnership with the diplomats, the decision makers, and the public to, to one, ensure that the COVID-19 rescue funds really accomplish multiple goals, not only eliminating the pandemic, but restoring livelihoods and achieving greater sustainability and resilience of our societies. Second, reducing the barriers to international scientific collaboration and enhancing international cooperation and coordination among countries to help develop solutions to our national and global problems. If there's anything we should have learned from the pandemic is we have to deal with this on a multilateral uh, collaborative basis. Third is to strengthen trust in science. And fourth, uh, reduce inequalities in society. So it's my belief and I think uh, shared by Vic and many of us that the national interest of the United States is to make all countries of the world more resilient, prosperous, secure, peaceful, sustainable, uh, and democratic. Uh, the, the panel you're gonna hear from shortly are four uh, heroes of mine, some from the incoming generation and some showing that the old generation can still contribute as well. And I think they'll be very illustrative of what can be accomplished. Uh, by all of us working together for science and technology for international development. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. That was a terrific overview and provides a lot of good things for us to think about um, as we proceed today and in the future. Um, before I introduce our next panelist, just a couple um, reminders. We, I'm not giving long introductions because we do have speaker bios posted on the CRDF Global website for this event. And maybe we can get a link to that posted in the chat window. 
Secondly, I see that um, someone has posted uh, a link um, on the roadmaps in the chat window. I invite everyone in the audience, if you have um, a link to a document that you think is relevant to the discussion, please feel free to post it in the chat window. Okay, so our first panelist is Dr. Takora Jones, who currently is the director of the Center of Director of the Center for Development Research, and, the, and she's also the Division Chief of the Higher Education Solutions Network in the US Global Development Lab at USAID. She joined AID in 2009 as a AAAS Diplomacy, Security, and Development Fellow. And that was at a time where science and technology and innovation was really taking off at USAID. So she was instrumental in helping develop that agenda. Um, she previously worked on energy and environmental issues for Senator Russ Feingold. So with that, I'll turn it over to Takura. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you to the rest of the panelists and all of those who have organized for today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you may be joining us. I, I am so inspired by the work um, that Victor was able to achieve. Unfortunately, I was never able to actually meet him, but it is clear from this panel and, and so many other things that I've learned about him over time that his work really laid the laid the foreground um, as he worked with others for the work that I've been able to do with so many of my colleagues at USAID. And so it's my pleasure to be able to talk to you all today a bit about where we are and where we're going in this landscape of science and technology for international development. So right now I work at the US uh, Global Development Lab as the director for the Center for Development Research. And really the lab actually is only six years old, um, but as Kathy mentioned, when I came to USAID in 2010, uh, excuse me, 2009, that was as we were just beginning with that previous administrator to really expand the aperture on science and technology um, and for development programs at USAID again. As was mentioned by um, some of our panelists before and Bill, as he mentioned in his paper, where USAID has been, there, there's been kind of ebbs and flows in how the agency has addressed and engaged science and technology for broader development means. You know, the connections that we have with the higher education community go back extensively. Um, one of our first administrators uh, had been the president of a university, Michigan State University. And so this, this connection with research, this connection with education, this connection with science and technology, all of these different elements have been part and parcel to how USAID has worked to achieve its ends. The Global Development Lab as a whole is working to lead integrating innovation technology and research into the transformation of development through our original experimentation and open innovation. We are really looking to take smart risks and bring new ideas into the agency and partner to scale them for impact. Part of the challenge of working globally is that every context is so particular, so specific, and so um, and just, just so kind of granular in how you might approach it. And so the work that we have been able to do is finding ways to take some of the approaches that we've learned about within countries where our missions are, bring them back out to kind of larger context and share some of those lessons. Like that's one direction. But another is to take ideas that have been happening kind of within universities or within the private sector and bring them into the agency to be able to engage them. Our approach really is trying to keep us at the forefront of science and technology, incorporating breakthrough innovations for our programs and policies. Um, some of the newer work that we've been doing has been in examining how digital is going to be transformational and really looking at our digital strategy. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through my points today. We work collaboratively. We, we work collaboratively um, with our agency and our and our partners to really kind of extend those breakthroughs. So what's really important to to know about kind of the landscape that we are moving into is that um, as part of USAID's broader transformation and reorganization as an entity, the lab will be moving to the Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation, or DDI. 
ADI will consist of several operating units that integrate and leverage the technical expertise and innovation to deliver programs that foster locally led and finance, finance developed development and support our missions in their efforts to de develop and deliver inclusive, equitable, and prosperous societies. The lab will essentially be transforming into an operating unit called Innovation Technology and Research, or ITR. So if at some point in the near future you are going to look for the Global Development Lab and do not discover it, it is likely it will be um, labeled ITR. And so know that that is where we still will be making our home. And CDR, the Center for Development Research, will be proudly making its home as the Office for Research within ITR. So we really will be carrying forward those core values of innovation technology and research to support USAID and help continue to support the evolution and changing nature of development um, so that we're transparent and accountable to the American taxpayers. Um, but what I really want to get to is a few examples of how our work um, over the last 10 years, because you know, some of what we are talking about predates the existence of the lab, the establishment of the AAAS program, AAAS Science Technology Policy Fellow, both what I came in as and what one of our other panelists was able to spend her tenure at USAID as, um, actually dates back to 1982. So as an agency, we have actually had more AAAS fellows in the executive branch than any other agency, something that we are incredibly proud of. So as we all know, um, scientific research is incredibly vital to addressing the world's most pressing development challenges. It increases our understanding of complex challenges and leads to more innovative solutions. But scientific research by itself is never enough. We have to design better programs and policies. We need better ways of communicating and translating science into action, science and research into action and really cultivating research culture and partnering with others to advance the use of data and evidence in decision making is a lifelong journey. Um, the, the ways in which we partnered you know, 10 years ago um, continue to evolve as we work to co-design and co-create research programming that creates a more effectual link between the research performed, the recommendations that it has, and how those recommendations can be potentially influenced. Through the lab's um, research team, uh, the, well, through the Center for Development Research, we've built more than 100 worldwide university consortium that respond to complex development problems with research designed to assist our field missions with tangible and actionable solutions. One of the most recent examples of this is our program that was recently launched earlier this year called Bridge. Um, the winning, um, the winning university for this particular program was Arizona State University. And their proposal is called Cariska. So you'll see more about that um, in the coming weeks and months. But this particular program is working to revolutionize the supply chain approaches in Africa through local knowledge and sci local scientific engagement. In addition, we also have the Bridge Train Program, which works to draw on the strengths of our global academic community to solve high priority development challenges through innovative and tools and approaches. So, you know, the ability to kind of build relationships and partnerships and advance high quality research and research utilization, as I said, is primarily through how we are able to work with higher education institutions to bring their in ingenuity and innovative approaches to solve critical challenges along what we term the journey to self-reliance. Um, if we are creating a global scientific citizenry, we want to be able to ensure that we can do so in a way that creates equitable partnership between universities and the countries in which we serve and universities um, that may be more established in other places. So we support research to achieve advancements across the full spectrum from discovery to incremental improvements to broader game-changing breakthroughs. But since the lab was established in 2014, We've supported 233 different institutions, over a thousand different research products, and used scientific research and outcomes to improve development outcomes that 
you know, span and kind of 35 different program and policy changes. So how we've started measuring things more recently is not just through the output of academic papers, which while important for the broader process of how higher education institutions work, isn't necessarily sufficient for how we engage with international development. And so we've started looking at how we can actually track program and policy changes more broadly through how the research is actually able to influence not just the academic community that it may be operating in, but the broader communities where the research may be impactful, whether that's at a local level, a subnational level, national level, or a global level. And so we've been able to track 35 of those different changes that were influenced by the ways in which our partners were, were able to work effectively to help make those changes. So we have a lot of different kind of smaller activities that have been happening. One that's most familiar to likely most of the people on this call is the Partnerships for Enhanced Engagement in Research or the PEER program, which will turn 10 years old next year. Through, that, through the work with PEER, we have been able to provide grant funds to researchers and scientists in our US, USAID partner countries uh, to conduct research with US government funded research the US government funded researchers in the US. And so it strengthens these research partnerships and translates to locally developed data and evidence that can then lead to changes in policy and practice. Over 3000 students have worked on peer research teams. 50% uh, of those are women and they contributed to over 900 publications and journal articles. One of the successes from peer has been, you know, working on endangered wildlife tra trafficking um, there, there has been efforts to obscure the identity of bushmeat to evade inspectors in Africa in particular. And the inspectors lacked the evidence to be able to prosecute offenders despite suspicious um, suspicions of illegal activity. And the peer program um, that worked with the Smithsonian Institution, the Kenya Wildlife Service and the Kenya East and East Kenya and East Africa Regional Mission were able to uh, essentially work to sequence, catalog, and document the DNA of endangered wildlife, convert those sequences to easy to test barcodes, and then essentially use that database of DNA barcodes with law enforcement to prosecute tra traffickers using DNA evidence. So that's the kind of broader policy change uh, that essentially it, we are supporting research to be able to engage through. So that continuum is one that would not just happen if we were only working in spaces where we were partnering with a higher education institution absent a broader set of partnerships that extend to the government and policymakers. So the other thing I'll spend a couple moments talking through and I'm trying to look to check my time. Okay, um, is essentially the work that we have been doing, thank you, your son, the work that we've been doing on our digital strategy. So I'll finish with that. So, you know, you might have noticed in the last 20 years that um, mobile phones and, and other such tools have essentially taken over the entire world, not just um, the US and, and Eastern and Eastern Europe, uh, Western Europe. And as such, I think uh, the development world may have been taken a bit by surprise initially by the advancement, uh, the rapid advancement of mobile phones into the landscape that we operate in. But we essentially have been building on, you know, a significant amount of lead USAID leadership within this space to launch the digital strategy that was launched earlier this year that outlines our deliberate and holistic commitment to improving measurable development and humanitarian assistance outcomes through the use of digital technology to strengthen open, inclusive, and secure digital systems. So um, the strategy, which I can drop a link um, below because it is you know, free and open to the public, is rather ambitious. And as we are working with our partner countries to think about how digital economies are transformational, it's something that exciting that we see for it for us. I see Kathy has come back on, which is my signal to stop. Thank you. And I look forward to the broader discussion. Thank you, Takora. That was terrific. Our next speaker is Dr. Katherine Himes, 
who directs the University of Idaho McClure Center for Public Policy Research and the Idaho Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Like many in, in involved in today's session, she was a AAAS s and Policy Fellow uh, working at State and USAID. And Catherine was one of the first, if not the first, uh, AAAS uh, policy fellow assigned to a USAID mission overseas. In her case, she went to Central Asia. So with that, I'll turn it over to Catherine. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kathy. And it's such a pleasure to be here, to be on this panel, to be part of this symposium. <clears throat> Um, my remarks really are based on my experiences as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow in the USAID Office of Science and Technology, which was a precursor, in a sense, to the USAID Global Development Lab, and as a AAAS s and Overseas Fellow in Central Asia. Um, I just want to make a friendly uh, correction to the, the point that, that Kathy noted. The overseas program actually existed well before my time at USAID. And then I was part of, I think, that second wave of fellows to serve in such a capacity. So there were others, um, I believe, in the 80s, perhaps the early 90s, who were able to do just that. Um, so again, I'm, I'm going to couple my experiences and Bill's paper on where we've been, where we are now, and where we need to go. So again, I'm gonna focus on Central Asia and my work there included Afghanistan and really focused on water. So where we've been in that region? Well, during the Soviet Union, Moscow led decision-making for the then Central Asian republics with respect to coordinating water, funding research, and really determining international research collaborations. After the end of the Soviet Union, the new countries really experienced challenges maintaining research funding, improving livelihoods, attracting young people to science, and cooperating with Afghanistan on water. There were significant geopolitical factors that impacted the ability to collaborate on water, chief among them outdated or absence of water treaties. Some regions, um, some international boundaries had no water treaties. A lot of the treaties were actually from the 1940s, 50s and 60s. Also, these new countries were really focused on forging their national identities. What did, it, what did it mean to be Kazakh or Kyrgyz or Tajik? That's very different than being part of the Soviet Union. And there was this absence of Moscow coordination on water sharing as well as water energy sharing. Some countries in the region, as many of you well know, are very close to the high mountains. And these are called the Tian Shan Mountains. And, and the countries near the mountains were able to access water. And those countries that were more uh, in a desert landscape didn't have that key access to water. When they were all part of the Soviet Union, it made sense to trade energy, to trade water, for Moscow to determine these water sharing agreements. But then these new countries, it was just very difficult to cooperate. So I really wanna focus on the where we are now. And I have a few slides to share that illustrate uh, my experiences as a AAAS science and technology policy overseas fellow. When I arrived in Central Asia and I was, I was posted to Almaty, Kazakhstan, that's the former capital of Kazakhstan, I was asked to build a regional water program. And I was asked to focus on how we support transboundary cooperation among the Central Asian republics, but also to incorporate Afghanistan. I worked on a multidisciplinary team and I specifically built this team because I knew we needed a lot of different perspectives in order to make a program that would be durable. Um, as Bill articulated in his presentation today, as well as in his paper, 
So the whole goal here is for us not to be in a position of supporting these countries, but for them to grow their science and technology capacity, their research capacity, and for them to be able to work without um, US or, or other countries supporting them in this manner. So I asked another AAAS science and technology policy fellow, one who is based in Washington DC to join this team. I also asked a water expert also based at USAID in Washington, a conflict mitigation specialist, because I knew conflict was part of what was happening in, in Central Asia, as well as a locally employed staff member. So we were this five person team and we traveled all across the region. And we talked with local water managers, we talked with researchers at universities, we talked with government officials, and we also met with other international donors. And we came up with a program that has three parts. And I think these three parts really mirror the recommendations in Dr. Paul Glazer's paper. I'm gonna share my screen. And I have three slides. Each slide illustrates one leg of, of this programmatic stool. This first slide focuses on incorporation of indigenous knowledge. This is something that Dr. Cole Glazer mentioned in his paper. So again, focusing on water in Central Asia and Afghanistan, there's so many local water managers, and they have tremendous knowledge. Some of them are part of families, communities that have measured water for generations. And they really know how the water's changing with respect to climate change. Um, and so the, the challenge here though, is that they don't have these innate skills to cooperate across a border, an international border. So we found a local organization based in Kazakhstan that worked around the region to teach small basin council planning. So to, to leverage this indigenous knowledge and to grow the indigenous knowledge. So I have pictures here of small basin councils, uh, just a single country working in that single country at the very local level, but then building the skills to work across countries. So on the left, some pictures of these local small basin councils. In the middle, I have pictures of um, a, a water meter. Sometimes the solution to being able to support a treaty is incredibly simple. And here uh, at the top, uh, somebody is showing this agreement, this water sharing agreement from the 1940s that could never be enforced because there was no way to measure how much water was being used. And so there's this wonderful picture here at the bottom uh, of a ribbon cutting ceremony for this water meter. So mission directors from two missions. And then uh, in the upper right, there's a picture of water feeding into that water meter so that this treaty can be enforced. And of course, bottom right, there is a celebration, a big celebration, because finally, we know that the, the water is actually being used appropriately. Dr. Jones mentioned peer. And peer was a huge part of our three-legged stool. We really sought to strengthen and expand research capacity in Central Asia and Afghanistan, specifically on water. We wanted other countries to chart their own path in science and technology. Uh, and so here we have some pictures of a, a water project in Uzbekistan on the left. And then the pictures on the right really focus on um, some work that I did in Afghanistan. The top right, these are the first peer water awardees in Afghanistan, these two women. Um, to my right. And then the bottom picture is a training workshop I held. How do you write a competitive proposal for peer? The final leg of the stool was to support formal multilateral cooperation. And this was to join a World Bank led energy water program that supports Central Asia and Afghanistan. Um, I'll just speak very briefly to some of the accomplishments of this program. There were 20 peer water pro projects across the region. 36 students trained and integrate, integrated water resources management principles at the master's level. 50 students with master's in engineering focused on water resources. 13 small basin councils and eight watersheds with 17 joint meetings. 
2,800 participants trained in water resources management and water diplomacy and international water law through 100 different events. And then finally, 30 government administrators in leadership program. I'll say that these are these three legs of the stool, this approach really underscores the importance of development and diplomacy working hand in hand. And finally, I'll just touch on where we need to go. I see that Kathy's here giving me my time warning. I think that we need to continue to do more of this to support multilateral collaboration and partnerships and really decrease barriers to S&T cooperation in the region. I'll say that, that this work I described was a five-year program funded by USAID at the $10 million level. And I'm thrilled to report that USAID just announced the next five-year program that's two and a half times the funding. It's almost $25 million. Um, and so I'm, I'm just thrilled that we were able to bring together this team and, and um, create a program that really aligns with what what I think are sound principles for SNC and development. Thanks very much, Kate. Our next speaker, Dr. Tone Nguyen, is a senior scientist in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. He also was a AAAS SNT policy fellow at NSF and also a Fulbright fellow. He also is chief architect of MekongWater.org, which is a premier data sharing and collaboration platform in the Mekong region for water and water related data. So I'll turn it over to you, To. Sorry, I, um, I was still muted. Um, again, thank you, Kathy. Um, and I would like to also echo what my um, colleagues have said so far, uh, uh, um, expressing my gratitude for being part of this very wonderful and important um, conversation. I would like to start by sharing sc a screen. Um, if someone can give me a thumbs up or something that you're able to see this screen. Um, of course, um, I was hoping that Kathy wouldn't mention it, but uh, I am in fact a computer scientist, um, but please give me a chance. Um, I'll try to make some virtual eye contact. And um, you know, with this presentation, I even added animations to, to, to keep you everyone awake. Um, so yes, please bear with me. Uh, I would like to offer a perspective that uh, maybe um, a, a slight bit of a departure from what my uh, colleagues have offered so far, which is um, a really at a broader level um, and very meaningful um, policy development, um, building programs, and just um, uh, wonderfully moving the, the needle and the progress on um, science and technology for development. I uh, would like to offer a perspective of someone um, who has performed some of this uh, this work uh, underground, uh, having having travel and uh, and do this um, specifically in in these countries, and of course um, with with that. The, um, the, the perspectives are all mine, um, and I'm sure um, some of you may uh, disagree, but um, you know that we'll, we'll just leave it at that. First, I would like to um, to lay the context just just very quickly. This is this is an age old problem, and it will be um, familiar to everyone. Um, we're talking about the the river, specifically the uh, Mekong River Basin in Southeast Asia, um, which um, starts about in China. And it ends in Vietnam in the uh, in the Delta, and it goes through um, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, um, and a little bit of, of Myanmar as well. And so, as as you can already envision, um, the conflict that really could arise from this um, it's um, a share resources uh, by by these competing um, competing um, countries, and so. Of course, there, there, there are so many dimensions to this that would take so many days to unpack. And um, if we even attempt, it will probably make it worse. Um, but I would like to share what, from my perspective, um, what really captures the, um, the, the friction here. And so um, aside from where it starts in China, the, uh, the lower part of the, the, uh, the Mekong Basin, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, and, and uh, uh, Cambodia, the, um, this, this part that um, is in the, uh, the circle there is what we would consider sort of like the the upper part 
um, of the uh, or the, the middle part of the basin. And let's look at what um, uh, folks are able to do with it. The the river is really a life um, a life force. It, it's just it really um, it underpins the the uh, the economy and the livelihood there. And so in this part of the um, uh, the basin, people are able to, of course, enjoy the water for drinking, um, for fishing, and using some of it um, to grow upland crop and such. And it is really wonderful. But um, contrasting that to the, the delta, uh, people are able to do so much more because the land is fertile, is, is sediment, they're able to grow rice, um, they're able to fish, um, grow you know upland crop at a much higher scale, and then also you know use it to for navigation and, and transportation. And so um, this has been a traditional, um, the, the traditional um, use of the water, but then comes this, this these advances, industrial advances, advances in uh, technology. And um, that led to, to many things, but one of the more infamous um, 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 development that we've heard about are these um, essentially dams, um, these hydro dams. Uh, they're being built in, in China, being built in, uh, in Laos and in Cambodia. Um, and they are, you know, traditionally we would look at it and, and we think about being hydroelectric, but then also they allow people to irrigate, um, pull a lot more water out of the river and, you know, grow more crop. It's um, the, the level of which the, the water resources being used is it's just, it's just changed. It's, it's quite different than uh, how it traditionally was. And this, um, as you can imagine, if you're downstream, way downstream in the uh, in the delta, or even in the um, the Tonle Sap River in Cambodia, um, has has really um, significant consequences um, from um, droughts, prolonged droughts, to salinity invasions coming in with the tide, um, to not so much sediments coming down anymore because it's caught inside the dams, and so these guys get to go out together and and they argue um, and they form. Um, committees, the river, the Mekong River Commissions, for example, to, to try to co-manage. But it's really um, a difficult situation. And from this, um, what from, from what I have pulled out of this, um, it's really important to me, is that there are no nefarious actors here. Um, these Everyone really start from a place of um, looking out for their own uh, people's interests. And there are no great solutions. Um, I, th I think it was um, Takora that, that mentioned, you know, every context is different. Um, it's so specific. And so there, there's, just, there's just no way you can, you can come up with a solution that works for, um, that everyone is happy with. And um, from the perspective of a technologist, um, I um, appreciate that it really was the, the industrial and technological advances that really um, amplify these competing interests. And so, and of course, one of the advantages of working um, overseas is you have these these really amazing photos to to amaze and, and confuse your audience. Um, and then the the U.S.'s interest in this, and this is where I engage in, um, just just broadly, very broadly, um, from my perspective, is um, the U.S. would like to see regional security and stability. Um, they would like to compete um, influence against China. Um, China really is building its, its influence in the region and the US would like to, to push back on some of that. And of course, trade and commerce. Um, everyone on this, um, this call today probably know a lot more about um, these things than I do. But to me, what's really important here is that um, none of it is nefarious. Like our interest there is just um, no, nothing that is bad. And so that really is important to me as I, as I engage my expertise and, and, and do this work. And so how does science and technology and me fit in on this? Um, to me really, it's, it's what are these folks looking for that we're trying to work uh, with them on and, and specifically um, to technology. Um, these guys are interested in jumping on the big data bandwagon. Why not? Everyone's working on it. Uh, but honestly, it's not, it's not all bad. Um, doing big data, um, work, um, it can really be a benefit you. Um, folks there want to join the smart city fad. It's, you know, putting lipstick on an old doll, I guess, but um, there, there are some really useful things uh, from the smart city conversation. And then, you know, they also would like to convene. They would like to, to, to meet each other. They meet international collaborators and, and we all do it and uh, build community and not all of it, um, are redundant. And so um, 
the point to, to all that, I have fun with these, um, with these points, but uh, the point is that um, we're not providing MATLAB trainings anymore. Uh, we used to go there and provide trainings on algorithms, on new tools and, and such, but you know, there's the internet. People can, can get this content. And YouTube is probably a lot better teachers than I could ever be on some of these, um, these more um, specific items. And so um, just as to summarize the work that I, 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 I've been working on in the past few years, uh, we built a data sharing platform. Um, the really cool thing about our platform is that uh, it allows untrusted partners um, to work together. And I have a chat, um, oops. And then, um, you know, we, we have an active grant with NSF uh, for um, smart cities um, in, in Ho Chi Minh City. And then we've been holding these uh, Mekong Research Symposiums. And the, the last one was this last um, December. Um, and we had about 300 people attending. Yikes. Uh, by popping on, you have killed my um, slides. And so uh, I just want to summarize with a few words. Um, the, development, the development landscape, um, uh, I, I don't know if I can speak at the landscape level, but I would say the needs, uh, they have changed, right? Um, and so, so now some of these lessons, a lot of it is, is um, we're familiar with, but I want to wrap up by um, looking toward the futures. And since you know, I'm not a policy wonk. I don't know how to look at the futures, but I would like to call out some of the things that we, the, the risks that we might want to consider. One is um, advances amplify differences and challenges. Um, leapfrogging has a price and um, technologies transfer, so do problems. Now we're going to have to deal with uh, data privacy, security, and all those things that the US have been um, dealing with. And um, the problems are changing. So we need to engage deep technical expertise. And then of course, um, the, the, while the playing field is leveling, um, who's, who gets to play, right? Um, we're, I'm a little tired of seeing the, all the usual suspects when I get to all these conventions. So um, how do we get to, to more folks? And with that, um, I wouldn't be uh, a UVA um, person if I don't put up a picture of um, our beloved Mr. Jefferson here. He perhaps is the original science diplomat. Um, and thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much, Tom. That was interesting. Our next speaker is Al Watkins, who's founder and chairman of the Global Solutions Summit, which focuses on strategies to promote the large scale development of technology based development solutions in emerging markets. Um, let's see. I had the pleasure of working with Al during his 23 years at the World Bank, where he really played a pivotal role in raising the visibility of science and technology and innovation in World Bank programs. So Al, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with everyone else. And I don't think my video is working, but um, as long as you can hear me, that's, that's good enough at this point. Um, and I'm going to try to share a screen. And if that doesn't work, I will just talk. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be working for whatever reason. Um, you can see your screen now. Oh, OK, very good. Thank you very much. Um, so I decided to entitle my talk, Science and Technology for Development, From Russia to Rwanda and Beyond. And why did I pick that title? Uh, three reasons. One, it basically tracks the themes of this today's symposium and the prior uh, session of this symposium. We started with Russia. Now we're looking at international science and technology cooperation for development. Uh, so Rwanda reflects that and other countries. But it also, these two things, Russia, Rwanda, reflect the yin and the yang, as I see it, of international science and technology cooperation for development. So I want to explore these themes with you uh, for a few minutes this morning. So when I first got involved, as Kathy uh, mentioned, I was working on uh, Russia for the World Bank and eventually also ended up doing uh, research and projects on science and technology, Russia, Kazakhstan, Latvia, and Ukraine. The World Bank as an organization obviously had a much wider scope uh, just in uh, Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union. But my personal journey started in Russia and then moved to the other countries, Ukraine, Latvia, Kazakhstan. So 
in Russia, when we got started, when I got started, the World Bank got involved in these issues. Uh, interestingly, at the request of Mr. Putin, President Putin to uh, Jim Wolfenson, the president of the World Bank, the issue in Russia, as we saw it, was very simple. Russia had world-class scientific capability, but the links between that research cap capacity and global markets had uh, been severed. The, the Comic-Con system, the Soviet system, did have its own internal logic, and it created links between Russia's research capacity, the civilian economy, the defense and space sector of the economy, and to a limited extent as well to international markets. Those links had all been severed by the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the objective then was to build new links, figure out new links, especially for weapons of mass destruction scientists, scientists building weapons of mass destruction, find civilian uses for their work. Uh, CRDF was one of the premier institutions involved in this. Uh, the World Bank came in as well. Uh, and my work within all of this at the World Bank focused on two issues in Russia. One was the Sea Launch Project, which was a joint venture between Boeing and various organizations and institutions in Russia, Ukraine, and also some in, uh, companies in Norway to use Russian rockets and launch systems to launch commercial civilian communication satellites uh, into orbit. One of the first customers uh, for the Sea Launch Project was Sirius XM. So if you listen to satellite radio, the initial satellites were put in place by this uh, project, which the World Bank was involved in. It was the World Bank's only uh, space sector project. Uh, I had the privilege of leading the World Bank team in this. But again, the whole theme was to find, here was a Russian sector that was globally competitive, find commercial uh, uh, markets for it. And I also generated a report from knowledge to wealth, transforming Russian science and technology for a modern knowledge economy. Now, again, as I said, the issues in Russia were finding links between this advanced scientific capacity and markets for that scientific capacity. And that's where we joined with CRDF. When we, then I got asked to move and lead World Bank efforts in some of the least developed countries. So moving from Russia to the least developed countries and low income countries, their objectives were to enhance productivity and competitiveness by using technology for more productive factories, more productive farms, and more productive processing activities. That was one goal. How do we enhance productivity? How do we use technology to enhance this productivity? The second goal for these countries was using technology to promote inclusive, affordable access to potable water, off-grid renewable energy, food security, ICT connectivity, jobs, uh, high quality healthcare, but at a reasonable, affordable cost. Again connecting technology uh, to the needs of the countries, but in a different way, because for the least developed and for the low income countries, unlike Russia, unlike Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Latvia, they had weak scientific R&D and technical capability. You didn't go to these countries because their research capacity was on a global uh, par. They had weak scientific capacity. Most of the countries, the least developed and low income countries, were gonna be consumers, not producers of knowledge. And that knowledge was gonna be generated elsewhere. And so the objective for these countries was to develop the capacity to find, adapt, and deploy at scale this global supply of research and technology. They weren't gonna produce it themselves but they would be consumers and they needed to find it, adapt it to meet their needs, adopt it, and then the critical last step in the process, deploy it at scale uh, to solve their problems. And that's why some of the Global Solutions Summits, uh, the theme of them was from the lab to the last mile, taking the technology that already existed that had been produced elsewhere and figuring out how to use it in remote rural villages, 
in poor urban settlements, things of that nature. And this really was a technical, a business, an operational, a sociological, and it required technical, business, operational, sociological, and logistical know-how. It didn't require research and development as much. It required other sorts of skills. So the deployment challenge, as we called it, strictly speaking, was not an R&D problem. The, the solutions existed. R&D was being done. More solutions were coming online all the time by scientists elsewhere, as well as by scientists who were working in all the wonderful collaboration programs that, all, that Bill Koglazer and so many other speakers have discussed today and previously. But for the developing countries, the least developed countries, their challenge was not an R&D problem. And therefore, scientists were not necessarily the most important actors for them. They were important, but there were other actors that needed to be brought into the discussion. And the STI cooperation should, needs to adjust accordingly, in my humble opinion. Um, so I'll end by just simply saying, so what's the riddle of technology deployment? You have a series of broken circuits, in my opinion. Technology vendors are out there. People with solutions are out there. They're looking for customers, but they don't know how to find customers in developing countries, with whom to do business, how to organize supply chain, or they need help organizing supply chain, operations and maintenance operations, payment operations. They don't know if you're a technology purveyor whether you're gonna be just merely a vendor or you're gonna go into a country and then start operating potable water businesses. You, you've, you've developed in, in your lab a wonderful nano filter for generating potable water. What are you gonna do with it? To whom are you gonna sell it? Who is your partner gonna be? Are you gonna be the one operating potable water operations in 10,000 villages uh, in five, 10, 15 different countries? If it's not gonna be you, who's gonna do it? How are we gonna figure this out? Uh, and how are you gonna finance all of this? These are the issues of getting technology from the lab to the last mile from the perspective of the technology vendor. And from the perspective of the least developed countries uh, that are looking for solutions, they're facing a different set of questions. Which of these many solutions that are out there is going to be cost effective and affordable? Which of these many solutions is going to develop, deliver the expected benefits? to my community, to my country? Are these technical solutions tailored to the specific needs of my company or my country? Or were they developed for the United States or someplace else? Or maybe uh, they were developed um, for a country in Asia, but it's not gonna work in a least developed country in Africa. How are we gonna figure all of this out? Last but not least, what are the business and technical requirements for deploying this technology at scale on a financially and operationally sustainable basis. So I will close by simply saying that we need the international scientific cooperation in the R&D sphere, but I think we need to sort of take a wider angle view to use photography metaphor and realize that after you've developed something in the laboratory, this whole issue of technology deployment comes up. It raises critically important issues for making sure that the international scientific cooperation is effective on the ground to uh, affect people's lives. And as we move forward with science technology cooperation for development, uh, I just simply would uh, suggest that we need to address these additional issues as well so that we maximize the, effect of all, the effectiveness of all of our efforts. And with that, I will stop and say thank you for your time and attention. Thanks very much, Al. I'd now like to invite Dr. Michael Green uh, to give about five minutes of comments. Uh, he was mentioned earlier in the presentation in that he overlapped with Vic at the National Academy of Sciences where Dr. Green was research grants director at Boston. Dr. Green. I'm here, I'm, I don't think I'm on the screen yet. Well. Okay, I'm very pleased to be here. I have very good memories of Vic and I'm very happy to share them with you, but I have to be quick. 
So uh, around, let's start with this way, around 1980, the Carter administration was ending. And in its wake, there was perhaps a little more receptiveness in, in the government for new initiatives to utilize science and technology, improve lives, and specifically toward developing countries. In particular, and I think many of you of a certain age will remember this, USAID was preparing a new approach to assisting developing countries to develop their scientific capability. It was called ISTC, Institute for Science and Technological Cooperation. And it involved USA, USA giving research grants to institutions in developing countries. This is a, a novelty. And it would be supported by US consultant visitors, purchase of equipment and, and, and taking care of the needs of a, of a research program. Uh, However, there were problems in Washington. Uh, Washington uh, the Congress did not want to create a new agency. And uh, President Con uh, Carter was himself in favor, but he lost the 1980 election. Uh, so the C C Congress had some support and the US aid was encouraged to find some substitute with a smaller budget. Now, this is the way I heard it. On the last day of the Carter administration, Victor Rabinowitz went to visit USAID and he returned with $36 million in his pocket and a lease to create a new program to take up the mission of the ISTC in partnership with USAID. This was an incredible coup for Victor. Um, but uh, his, let's see, the, the advantage of this beyond uh, having the money to give to developing countries is that it enabled uh, the Academy Boston in particular, to give grants to non-aid countries that had never been allowed to receive U.S. funds before. Uh, the research, this research to, to countries that had, were a little more um, uh, developed uh, scientifically could benefit developing countries in general. So we could give grants to countries like Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Thailand, and Malaysia. Uh, even Sweden, who got a, which got a grant to provide some services. Well, Vic's problems were not really over because his problems still had to be accepted by the governing board of the NRC. And an advanced program, of course, is very different from the usual advisory study that we make. And there was some doubt about doing it. But finally, Vic was able to prepare a, a uh, uh, program to AI, USAID that was approved by the governing board. So a committee of research grants was formed to choose topics and approve grants. The chairman of the committee was Fred Seitz. who was a form of uh, NAS president. And the committee later included Roger Revelle, Carl Jurassic, David Pimentel, and many well-known uh, experts, including some from developing countries and even from the social sciences. The first task was to select the research areas. AID uh, proposed or uh, required that six topics were chosen and they would be, have to be approved by AID. However, the grants themselves did not have to be and they were sorry, of the academy. Uh, well, they chose six topics. These were the following. The grain amaranth, this was a nutritious grain growing in Central America, which some people call the next soybean. And you can still find it in supermarkets here. Biological nitrogen fixation, of course, essential for legumes. Fast growing nitrogen fixing trees for firewood and fertilizer. Acute respiratory infections in children. This is a leading killer of children in the developing countries. And mosquito vector field studies against malaria. And a new, um, a new uh, topic, which was not, really, uh, not seen before, I think, rapid epidemiological techniques which are important for diagnosis, epidemiological studies, but not very well developed in the developing countries. And this is an attempt to uh, suit them better to the, country, to the users. Each program, as it began, began with a meeting in Washington of the best known uh, researchers in this topic by the, from developing countries. Uh, this, this would give us uh, help to prepare a document which would, would survive as the program and, and and describe the goals and problems of the, of, uh, that are in the field in the developing countries. 
but these people could also be counted on when they got back to their own countries to find some good researchers to quickly submit proposals and give us a quick start. Now the pro the problem is that these were supposed to be real pro projects, judging by the most, uh, most important criteria. And so we decided to use US proposals the US style proposals and send them to American scientists to, to, to uh, review, to show that this, this is not to, supposed to be uh, a special baked uh, projects. Uh, we, the reviewers were even asked to be kind and helpful and a few even were, but the reviews came coming back were shocking because they had been on American uh, criteria. So we had to deliver them pers personally to the um, applicant by one of the staff members. We would travel to the country carrying our, our the, the, the proposal and the, the criterion, which inevitably caused, caused shock in the, uh, by the receptors. And we had to say that, uh, we had to make certain that they, they knew that this is not the end of the story. This is the beginning of your proposal writing. And now what are you going to do to make this pro proposal get funded? We, uh, all of us got to uh, take the turns to do that. It was really something that was, was rather interesting to do. Later, we gave proposal writing in, in many countries. We organized coordination meetings for all the projects in each field, bringing the, the principal investigators for each of those topics together and uh, encouraging them to visit each other and to collaborate when it's possible. We had, uh, being a, uh, handling large sums of money, we had a financial auditor, a very brave woman who visited every project and even she stopped one of them. The average grant was about $100,000. The program lasted for a decade, decade when a new Senate uh, coming to power, uh, in the US Senate that is, gave all the un unspent money, which are still owed to grantees to Israel and abruptly cut off the funds for our incomplete grants. However, in the end, 400 papers were published in, renewed, in reviewable journals and some of our, our grantees became important figures in these countries and internationally. Uh, late in the game, uh, Vic Victor organized and chaired an open meeting to celebrate the results, which was highly appreciated by the staff of the committee and by Boston and USAID as well. Well, I think I didn't uh, succeed in my time. Thank you very much. All right, we're now going to move into our question and answer period, and we can go till about 11.55. Um, again, I invite everyone to post any questions you have in the Q&A feature of uh, Zoom, and we're really hoping to hear from a number of people. We do have one question already, and um, this was posted towards the end of Al Watkins' presentation, and I presume it is intended for him, but all of the speakers are welcome to comment. The question is simple, how to find a customer. And I think this relates to Al's last slide on technology development. Al, would you like to respond? Well, how to find the customer. The, the I mean, th that's a really good question. And I don't think the, the sci th that's the problem. There is, uh, I, I, I called it a broken circuit. You, you have people here in on one place with technology, with solutions. Who is the customer? Is it gonna be the ministry? <laughs> is it going to be a social enterprise that's set up? Uh, one of, and this is one of the things we've, and watch the business model that that customer is going to used to deploy that technology at, at scale. One of the, th the, the main topic we've discussed at the Global Solutions Summit is precisely this. And we've showed that there, there is not one answer to that question. There's, if you take the issue of potable water, there are all sorts of different potential customers. There's the Safe Water Network, which is a foundation basically started by Paul Newman. When you buy Newman's own salad dressing, part of the, the profits go to the Safe Water Network. There's a company called Jibu, which is modeled after Starbucks and they're running water, potable water franchises all throughout Eastern Africa to serve low income populations in urban centers. Um, 
so in many cases, the customer is the social enterprise that goes, buys the technology because they have an idea of how to use it. Um, but that's a critical question you have to ask when you have your solution. Who's the customer for this? Who's actually going to take it and do something? And it's not Thank intuitively you. obvious. Thank you. So I invite all of the speakers and panelists to turn on your video so that you can participate in the, the session. And does anybody care to add to Elle's response? Okay, if not, I'd like to pose a question to the panelists. Um, several weeks ago, I participated in a workshop where a former USAID director talked about as one of the identified as one of the big challenges that USAID faces in all development agencies is scaling up. Um, innovative technology solutions to problems. Now, the number of you have touched upon this in your presentations, but I'd welcome your comments on whether or not you agree with that. Um, and if so, what are some possible approaches to addressing that challenge? Can I start? Yes, please, Tagore. I would say that, um... The question of scale has a, a lot of different answers to it. You know, scale in what context? Are we talking about scaling up the delivery or the um, kind of development of vaccines? Are we talking about scaling up particular approaches to how we engage with communities? Are we talking about um, scaling up the number of innovation ecosystems that we have available for people to be able to participate so we can have more hyper-localized problems. So my question back is scaling what? Are we talking about things, ideas, approaches? Like what are we talking about? Because each one of those has its own context and own complexity in which to operate. And if we are only talking about scaling things absent a broader context, then of course it's going to be hard to scale things because not all things are desired in every context. <laughs> um, but I, it, it is a challenge, but that is also because the world that we live in is culturally complex. And so appreciating that it might be that we need to think about scaling approaches and scaling ways that we engage so that, for example, the Resilient Africa Network that is housed at Makere University in Kampala, Uganda, is one of the partnerships that we have through the Higher Education Solutions Network. They have incorporated human-centered design and creative capacity building and other kinds of ways of engaging with communities so that they understand the customer or the consumer um, as it relates to potential innovation practices. Now, the customer or consumer could be a community member or it could be an NGO, or it could be a government. But scaling approaches to how you can engage with those actors in ways that are actually productive, as opposed to not productive or reductive, I think is, is one of the ways that we can create nuance within the conversation, because yes, it's hard, but it's always going to be hard if you don't know how to engage with the communities that you're working within and you don't know how to harness the systems that exist and then create opportunities to build upon that. Because the Resilient Africa Network exists not just because USAID put out a grants call in 2012. It exists because there were steps to get to what could colloquially be colloquially colloquial, I could never say that word, never mind, <laughs> um, essentially be called a center of excellence. There were steps to get to that. You had to have the capacity build by kind of the partnerships that they were having, like the, the actors that are in that center were having with the CDC and Hopkins and Tulane and others. You, you had to kind of get the systems built, the institutional capacity, you have to, like you have to make progress along that and when, when you talk about scale absent a contextual discussion, then it's like, because people always want to like liken it to like, why can't we get Coca-Cola everywhere? Well, because Coca-Cola is a beverage. Like, that's simple. Right. I will stop now. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, okay. I really like your answer and thinking about that question more broadly than I think it, it's often uh, done. Would anybody else like to yeah. comment? I, I would, Kathy, just uh, yeah. just briefly, uh, and thank you, Takora. Uh, 
just mentioned two elements of yours, but also the connection to public-private partnerships. I mean, in terms of scaling up technology and solutions, if you have large companies involved, they'd see it in their interest to create a public-private partnership that can uh, scale things up very quickly. Uh, of course, we've seen you know the scaling of smartphones in Africa, all those kind of applications, but then turning those applications into mobile banking and other things. Uh, then requires uh, additional partners. But I would like to mention one public-private partnership that uh, strongly impressed me when I was uh, in the State Department that, that Intel created uh, in Vietnam. They had a large fabrication facility outside Ho Chi Minh City, and they were hiring many engineers and technicians from Vietnam who did not have all of the skills. So Intel concluded it, as, it was in its interest to create a public-private partnership essentially to transform engineering education in, uh, in Vietnam. In the technical schools and the universities, they brought in agencies in Vietnam, agencies in the U.S., they brought in university, uh, Arizona State in the U.S., they brought in many other companies and created a multi-million dollar public-private partnership, which went a long way, I think, to transforming edu ed engineering education uh, in Vietnam. Thank you. You're on mute, Kathy, I think. Kathy, uh, I just wanted to add uh, one little example of the kinds of things we can do. When I had the very great privilege of working with you at CRDF Global, you'll recall a program we had with Kazakhstan, uh, which involved uh, research grants from the government of Kazakhstan to uh, uh, universities and technology institutes and so forth. And one of the things they did was they would ask private companies to suggest problems they had that needed technology solutions and then make grants to uh, the research institutes that perhaps already had technologies that were appropriate or uh, were in the process of developing. And in the, the way of doing that, uh, they were able to make the... Uh, the move from the laboratory into some kind of uh, commercial application. And there were several very good examples where that happened. Thanks, John. Okay, uh, we have only a few minutes and this is a complex question, but let's um, take some time on it. With improved development in a country should come the ability to help one's neighboring countries, especially with specific technology dependent problems. Are there notable efforts to catalyze cooperation between and among less developed countries in a region, perhaps assisted by the US or other developed country? Would anybody like to address that? Well, let me take one, one small slice of that, which is an anecdote that uh, actually took place in the office of the Safe Water Network. Safe Water Network is operating at quite substantial scale in Ghana. And I was in their offices in New York City. I was doing some consulting work with the African Development Bank with my colleague from the African Development Bank, who's from Burkina Faso, right next door to Ghana. And he said to the Safe Water Network, why don't you expand your operations from Ghana just a few miles to the north to Burkina Faso, my home country where we desperately need what you have. And the people at the Safe Water Network said, we don't have the, 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 the managerial and personnel capacity to operate in more than one country at a time. So we're doing something in Ghana, we're doing something in India, but we can't go to Burkina Faso but we're willing to train people in Burkina Faso, give away all of our know-how for free um, if you could get that organized. Uh, I think something along those lines would be a very interesting way to support international science cooperation so that successes in one country are, uh, are deployed and utilized by neighboring countries or more distant countries. Um, right. Thanks, Al. Catherine, I think you have something to add. Yeah, so I, I, the point about, is about countries working together regionally and how do we support that? So I think that the peer water program 
which was the five Central Asian republics plus Afghanistan and Pakistan, that's a great example of defining something by transboundary water and saying we're going to support this collaboration. Uh, I'll say that in addition to the partnerships between scientists and engineers in those countries and US scientists and engineers, there also were these regional fora that took place, I believe twice yearly. And so this was another wonderful way to build that research community and expand capacity. Thanks so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. And uh, so we're going to have to move on to our final wrap up session, but allow me to thank all of the speakers and panelists for your wonderful contributions today. And with that, I will turn it over to Gerson. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, everyone. What a fabulous discussion. And uh, uh, I, I I could, I could name names, you all know who you are. And uh, thank you all to uh, also to the uh, viewers for, for your questions and bearing with us. Uh, I do ask you to bear with me for uh, a little bit more than the time that um, I've allotted to myself uh, because I do have some uh, follow-up comments and uh, I will also be announcing a very important uh, competition uh, for young leaders in international science cooperation at the end of my remarks. Um, and uh, I, I hope that you all stay tuned in. Um, first of all, um, incredible thanks are due to our sponsors. The Richard Lansbury Foundation, our primary funder, uh, to CRDF Global, to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and to uh, various private donors, you know who you are. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, this has been so far uh, just a, a, a wonderful symposium series. And we have one more seminar coming up. It will be sometime after the new year. Uh, and the topic will be international security and arms control. So uh, stay tuned for that. We'll be announcing it on the CRDF website. I, I do have a couple of comments and um, they were actually uh, prompted by Michael Green's remarks. Uh, first of all, um, we've acknowledged Vic for many, many things, but a couple of things that came up during the, during the comments were um, about Vic's uh, incredible ability to find money for things. Of course, he was the senior vice president at MacArthur, which uh, which, which helped, uh, especially with the uh, basic research and higher education program at CRDF Global. But there have been many other examples. And uh, one of them uh, in connection with the, the BRHE program was that he was able to persuade the Russian government to co-fund that program. And we're talking about tens, the equivalent, the real equivalent of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and, and that was at the depth of the Russian uh, financial crisis of 1997, 1998. Um, so Victor really, Victor's role was foundational in so many different ways. And uh, I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, the second thing that Mike uh, mentioned was the challenge of introducing uh, competitive proposals to other countries. Uh, uh, one of, uh, if, if I had to name a, a lifetime contribution, um, uh, I'm retired from the National Science Foundation. That was my, that was my culture. Uh, and for a couple of years, I was on assignment to work with George Soros and his International Science Foundation, which was a, uh, 1993 and 95, it was a hundred million dollar uh, project and actually a little bit more to uh, uh, provide emergency support to the best uh, former Soviet scientists. And um, how do you define the best? Well, he asked me to design a program along the NSF lines and we spent about, oh, uh, at least a third of, of the uh, money that he allocated 
to a, a competitive grants program. And uh, let me tell you the challenge of describing that program and convincing 16 PhD uh, Russian scientists that it would work, uh, who were totally, totally skeptical and thought we were all crazy, um, was really uh, one, one of the great challenges and, and one, one of the great joys of my, of my career. We then uh, continued that. Um, I, was, I had the very great honor of being the founding president of CRDF Global and uh, we continued that at CRDF Global. And um, I think it's fair to say that in, not only in the former Soviet Union, but in, uh, in the whole range of countries that CRDF Global has worked with, um, proposal, competitive uh, proposal review, uh, grassroots uh, principal investigator initiated proposals has been accepted. And what a capacity building uh, a tool that is, because uh, at least I can say um, from the standpoint of the former Soviet Union, which I know best, um, I think it's fair to say that the scientists who have managed to survive and thrive as scientists are scientists who have been able to get uh, grants and support from international organizations that use the same uh, procedures uh, as, as we were able to introduce. So uh, I, I, uh, there's two comments by, by Mike that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to highlight. Um, so I am now going to share my screen and talk about something new. And that is that uh, we have been working very hard. Let, let, me, let me preface this by saying this symposium series was actually supposed to be a physical symposium uh, back in June at the, uh, hosted at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, but um, uh, things intervened and in the COVID epidemic, uh, pandemic especially. Uh, so we had a bunch of money that uh, was generously contributed by our sponsors and uh, we had to figure out what to do with it. Uh, and we decided that a very good use of it, and maybe even a better use than having uh, a, an elaborate uh, uh, dinner uh, at the symposium, which would have been very, very nice and a great tribute to Vic, but even a, a, an even greater tribute would be to have a competition to promote and uh, to promote and facilitate young leaders in international scientific cooperation. Because while this symposium, while our entire series has been retrospective in terms of honoring Vic and in terms of understanding what's gone before, our primary motivation for doing this is to look toward the future because that's what Vic already, always did. Vic was a person of great vision and, uh, and he cultivated young people and future leaders. So um, this is what we would like to do in a, in a very modest way. Uh, so let me outline the broad, uh, the, the, the broad um, features of this competition. This is not a formal announcement. It is a formal preview. Um, uh, we will be posting uh, these broad, uh, features of the competition on the CRDF Global website. Uh, and uh, we will be uh, launching the competition with uh, applications and procedures and so on uh, later in the year, probably in December. So this is the purpose uh, of, the, uh, of the competition, uh, of the award. Uh, it is to support research analysis or organizational work of young leaders in the three areas of our uh, symposium, namely international scientific cooperation, we're, we're casting a slightly broader net than US Russia, uh, science and technology for development, the topic of today's symposium and science for global security. And um, we're open on uh, the, the content uh, of 
of the uh, work that we want to recognize and encourage uh, in this competition. It could be to promote scientific collaborations. It could also be to promote excellent, outstanding work by young leaders on policy, because we've, we've really been discussing all of these things in, in our series. So the, the main details are, there will be three cash awards of $6,000 each to individuals or teams. They will be to recognize novel and promising forward-looking approaches to the solution of global problems in each of these areas. We're defining young, pretty much in the fashion of the National Science Foundation, uh, not by age, but by uh, time elapsed since the uh, since a PhD or, or equivalent degree. Uh, we'll be posting the details on the CODF Global website sometime in December. Uh, we're really almost ready to do that. The applications must be received by the end of May of 2021, and they will be awarded by the end of uh, calendar 2021, by, by December 31st of 2021. Uh, these will be cash awards. Uh, we will be expecting the applicants to tell us persuasively how they're going to apply the awards to their, uh, to their future work. Uh, but um, uh, this, this is, uh, these are the outlines of, of what we uh, are planning and, uh, and we really hope that there will be uh, broad participation in the competition. We'll be promoting it through, uh, through various scientific media, um, both in the US and internationally. Uh, I, should, I should hasten to add that, that um, uh, applications are open to uh, not only to US participants, but to, but to, um, uh, to young leaders from other countries. So uh, very, um, Excited to announce this competition. Uh, we have a, a, a wonderful team from our organizing committee that has been working very hard on it. Uh, I would like to thank our entire organizing committee for their work. Their names are on the CRDF Global website. I would also like especially to thank CRDF Global for accommodating us in so many ways. Uh, to thank Chris Addison and his colleagues at CRDF for their uh, wonderful technical support, which I would like to hasten to add um, uh, that CRDF Global as a sponsor uh, is making this assistance available uh, free of charge to us. Uh, so uh, it's an incredible contribution. Thank you everyone for participating in this seminar. Uh, we uh, hope to see you at our next seminar in, uh, I, I hope, January on international security and arms control. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will be posting these, these couple of slides about the competition on the CRDF Global website. We're not open yet to receive proposals, but we would be very grateful and encourage you to, uh, to provide this uh, information in a preliminary way to communities uh, of young scientists, young people involved in any way in international scientific cooperation, so they can begin thinking about, uh, about what they might do. Again, thank you very much. This concludes our meeting. Uh, please be well, be safe. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.